For hundreds of great shows like this one, go to onnetworks.com. Play Value is brought to you by Xbox Live Marketplace. The year is 1985, and video games kind of look like they were a fad. It looks like it was just a thing, it came and went, and now we're all ready to move on to our lives. Kind of like disco. It's just, it was there, it was big, now it's gone. Recently, Atari basically single-handedly uh, created the home video game market and destroyed it. Uh, there really was no appetite um, on both the part of people actually buying video games um, or like retail stores to even carry video games. Because Atari, you know, they made tons and tons and tons of money and then they were just gone. It's all about the home computer now. The people are looking toward the Commodore. They're looking to the Amiga, IBM, Apple. They're looking to buy these computers that offer more than just gaming. The funny part, if you think about that, is it's really only in America. You know, and so while American companies didn't want, you know, to touch video games with a 10-foot pole, video games are still going strong in Japan and Europe. So from the land of the rising sun, Nintendo looks over and sees 250 million Americans with nothing to waste their homework time on. And they say, we can conquer America and bring video games back. So over in Japan, Nintendo has this thing called the Famicom, the family computer and it's got very advanced graphics, and even more than that, it's got a controller that's a little more complex than what we're used to. Nintendo looks at America, and they're trying to figure out a way in, and they think, let's partner with Atari. Now, Atari, yes, Atari's dead in terms of consoles, but it has a name. Atari is a household name in America at this point. Nintendo isn't. Atari asked Nintendo, well, you know, what do you got for us? And they said, well, you know, uh, we have Donkey Kong. You can totally have Donkey Kong. It was a huge arcade hit. You know, it would definitely be a win for Atari. And so they're like, okay, cool. We could have very easily been playing the Atari Entertainment System instead of the Nintendo Entertainment System if it wasn't for one mistake. What happened, though, is Coleco, who had this home computer called the Atom, had published their own version of Donkey Kong, even without Nintendo's knowledge of that. Atari found out about this in the middle of their distribution uh, talks and just got so pissed off. Nintendo was like, no, 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 not us. It's Coleco's fault. You know, they don't have the rights to the game. They just made the game, you know, innocently or not. Eventually it all kind of got ironed out, but there was so much bad blood that the deal didn't happen. So Nintendo, they don't have any options. They're like, all right, let's just get this thing out there. Let's put it in front of people and get them excited about it. They take it to the Consumer Electronics Show, the biggest consumer electronics show in the country. Which is a big trade show for TVs, stereos, all kinds of electronic entertainment things. And they set up a booth, everyone comes by and says, oh, a video game console, nobody does those anymore. You guys are crazy, get the hell out of here. They're just like, video games, no one plays video games anymore. Like, what do you think you're doing? That's not gonna work. You're not gonna make any money off of that. You can't even use the word video games without people getting skeptical. So Nintendo calls it the advanced video system. And even still, with their little shenanigans, they did not attract any attention. They didn't sell a single unit. Undaunted, Nintendo returned uh, to the second CES later that year. They actually realized, if we can't win in the video gaming market, if everyone's telling us it's dead, let's just reposition it as a toy. So they rebranded this advanced video system, the Nintendo Entertainment System. It's an entertainment system because we're gonna add this little robot. He's called Rob, he's your robotic operating buddy. And we got a light gun, you can like shoot stuff. So it's like a toy really, it's not a video game system, it's a toy. Keep in mind at this point, uh, it's hard to imagine there was a time when Nintendo didn't come with Mario. But at this point, it's Duck Hunt and Robbie the Robot with Gyromite. That's what it's coming with. There's still a piece of the puzzle missing. And this time the reception, is a little bit better. They go, oh, okay, I can kind of see where you're going. I still don't want to buy any, but you're not totally crazy, and maybe you might eventually have something here, and we can talk about it later. The challenge for Nintendo at this point isn't selling kids on it. It was obvious that it was the greatest thing of all time. It still is. The problem was getting stores to sell it. So what ends up happening is Nintendo, the head honchos of Nintendo say, here's what you're gonna do. You're going to New York City in Christmas, 85, and you're going to sell door to door. They go to toy stores, they go to Macy's, anywhere that might sell a Nintendo, and uh, just put some good old-fashioned shoe leather into it and try to sell people in it face to face. They went to the stores and like set up everything, 
Like they said, like they brought the merchandise and they brought all the displays. That's some dedication there. <laughs> That's like you really believe in your product that you're selling. Nintendo said, put this on the shelves and you're not going to be stuck with it like you will all the other Atari stuff. If you put our stuff out and it doesn't sell, we're going to buy it back. That's impossible. Nobody does that. Nintendo did. So this strategy starts working. Nintendo sells a few consoles, they're feeling a little bit better, but they say we have to get into more stores, we gotta move more units, what do we do? Now in 1986, the two biggest toys were Teddy Ruxpin and Laser Tag, both made by Worlds of Wonder. So they contact Worlds of Wonder and say, hey Worlds of Wonder, if you can get us in all the department stores that your toys are in, we'll give you a percentage of our sales. Worlds of Wonder does this. By partnering with the sales force, Nintendo was actually able to get in to sales channels with leading toy chains and department stores that they wouldn't have had access to otherwise. How do they do this? Well, when a department store like Sears or JCPenney calls up Worlds of Wonder to place an order, Worlds of Wonder says, hmm, okay, yes, we'll give you 1,000 Teddy Rucks pins, which just happen to be the hottest toy in America right now. But in order to do that, you have to take 500 Nintendos. And everybody goes, oh, come on, but they do it. And it turns out to be a fantastic strategy because that gets Nintendos in front of the public and the public starts buying them up. So now it's starting to build a little bit of momentum, but then Mario comes out and now it's got a lot of momentum. That's probably one of the greatest games ever and it gave them a huge push. When I had the Nintendo, I also had the Teddy Ruxpin bear. Of course I got the Teddy Ruxpin first and I had it for a little while, but once I got the Nintendo, that thing was in the yard sale. The next year rolls around, 87, Teddy Ruxpin's over. Laser tag is over, but guess what? Nintendo is just taken off. They didn't need Worlds of Wonder anymore. They severed the agreement. And here's where Nintendo really enters just a golden age. Stuff like Metroid, Zelda, Punch-Out, Excite Bike, just all the first generation of Nintendo classics start coming out. And at this point, uh, it's built up so much steam you can't stop it. It's clear that it's more than a fad and it's a phenomenon. Now the golden age of Atari only lasted for a few years. Nintendo, they've been around if not always the top dog for more than 20 years and now with the Wii, they're back on top again. Could you imagine if there was no Teddy Ruxpin? We wouldn't know Nintendo like we do right now. Worlds of Wonder uh, would later file for bankruptcy and Nintendo would keep making uh, boatloads of money every day. You know, the Japanese brought video gaming kind of back to life. And so really that represented the shift of, you know, American control of the video game market to the Japanese control of the video game market. And you know, and they've been on top ever since. In 1990, Nintendo was one-tenth of the trade deficit between America and Japan. Just Nintendo products, that's how big they were. They knew that once kids played it, and once they had it, that it was just gonna catch on. And they were right, they were totally right. And then everyone made money and everyone was happy. <laughs> Rated E10 plus the T. Play the games everyone wants to play. For hundreds of great shows like this one, go to onnetworks.com.